This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1070, recorded on December 15, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Panama, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Don't have a bow tie on. I can't ask you what your bow tie looks like. I, I know, I know. People people commented about that. What What's different about Dr. Griffin <laughs> when they looked at my video from last week? Um, but let's get right into it because I am recording from a remote part of Panama. And my quotation, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Mm. And that's Isaac Asimov. It's uh, so true, right? Unfortunately, so true. <laughs> yes. Um, so I just thought I would give people a little bit of an update now that I've got slightly better bandwidth. Where where have I been for the last couple of weeks? And uh, so the, a week ago, ago, as opposed to this most recent week, I was uh, up in the mountains of eastern Uganda at the Foundation mm -hmm. International Medical Relief of Children Clinic um, on the Uganda-Kenya border. Um, working with a great team there. And just so nice to see how well the clinic is doing. Um, you know, it's a uh, real, real solid clinic connected with the government um, and just, just great work being done there. And then I ended up on a flight through Amsterdam, Panama City. Um, and then this last week I spent um, in a uh, couple remote isolated villages, uh, several hours by boat, uh, apparently it's the rainy season here as well as it was in Uganda and it just rained and rained and rained. So I am finally dry <laughs> at some point you just kind of give up, I guess. Uh, but, you know, sleeping in hammocks, uh, you know, using the same facilities that the local people use. My daughter Daisy was with us. Uh, she was under the weather in a, a couple ways, both under the uh, torrential rains and in other ways, but here working in, with an organization, uh, Floating Doctors, where they go out to um, these uh, villages and uh, provide medical care. So it's been a, been a wonderful experience, but here we are for our clinical update. And I'm gonna start, Vincent, with polio. Excellent. Still in the still in the headlines um, as we keep hearing about cases throughout the world, um, and I actually updated um, a bit of this when I was in Amsterdam en route from Uganda to Panama. Um, so uh, it was December 9th when I was doing that, um, and we read that um, Pakistan's last case, its sixth of the year, was reported in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, the country's hot spot. Uh, we've actually discussed that before. Um, uh, GPEI said intensified efforts are underway in the province, focusing on its southern region to stop WPV1 transmission, wild polio virus type 1 transmission. Um, and just to give people a little bit of an overview of what's going on here, I sort of went through Pakistan. We have one wild polio um, cases, 20 wild polio um, type one positive environmental samples, Algeria. We've got one circulating vaccine uh, derived polio virus type two um, positive environmental sample in the um, DR Congo, the DRC seven of the circulating vaccine derived uh, polio virus type one cases, uh, one uh, circulating vaccine derived polio virus type two case. Uh, Kenya, we've got two um, I'll just make it simple and say vaccine-derived <laughs> positive environmental samples, Mauritania, Nigeria, Somalia. So, um, you know, this just just is continuing. And I, and I think I just, just want to keep this on people's radar because there are people who are saying, oh, why do I need to go get a polio vaccine? Polio's gone. It's not a thing. And polio is not gone. Polio is a thing. And just really encouraging people to uh, take advantage of the protection. Uh, Vincent, did you have any comments? So some of these are wild polio, which is, you know, that is just a lack of immunization in Pakistan. But the others are all circulating vaccine-derived viruses. And so the way they control those is to go in with more OPV, which makes more circulating vaccine-derived viruses. So it's an endless situation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, the, the solution would really be to use IPV, but it's injectable and that presents other logistics. 
and yeah. it would allow poliovirus to circulate indefinitely. So <clears throat> there yeah. are all kinds of problems here. Yeah. Yeah. So challenges, but I think there is momentum towards, you know, injectable poliovirus vaccination. So let's see how that goes. Uh, the next article is really a warning for clinicians. I, I was actually surprised by this. Um, as much as I say, Occam was not a doctor and a patient can have as many diseases as they please. Um, hmm. The article, MPOX and chickenpox co-infection case series from Southern Nigeria published in JID. Um, and it turns out that in this retrospective cohort analysis of patients with MPOX, 28.6%, more than a quarter of them had a co-infection with chickenpox. Um, so you see those vesicles, multiple stages of development, and you think, all right, this is just good old chickenpox. Um, so you did not bother to test, but move forward with the confidence of a feral dog. And next thing you know, others are getting the MPOX. So it really reinforces how important testing is to medical diagnosis. I mean, we, we were taught this, like, okay, MPOX, they're going to be same stage of development, thicker roof, more more purulent. But once you start seeing those classic chicken pox, you know, different stages of development, thinner vesicle, mm -hmm. you think you have a diagnosis. But we we really we really need to reinforce. We need that uh, that testing to help us. And that's just huge. The fact that you know about one in three, one in four had chicken pox and mpox. And I will say, tis the season for vaccines. Um, RSV associated hospitalization rates remain elevated among young children. Um, you know, they're increasing among older, older adults and of note, only about 16%, only about 16% of adults 60 plus report having received an RSV vaccine. So over 80% are not protected. Um, so just talking about vaccination for adults, but what about nirsevimab or Bayfortis for the babies? Well, some of our listeners have written in. A lot of people are raising um, the alarm. People are listening. So thanks to everyone for speaking up. We just heard that in January next month, AstraZeneca, Sanofi to supply another quarter million more RSV infant shots to U.S. market. The additional supply means the company will deliver 1.4 million doses of the drug in the U.S. this year alone, over 25% more shots than they had originally planned. Uh, really doing a great job of communicating and people really appreciating the advantage here. Um, and, and why do we care so much? RSV is the top cause of hospitalization among infants. Um, you know, 1% to 3% of children under 12 months of age end up hospitalized in the United States each year. And that's data from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, where are we with weekly RSV? We may be reaching the peak here for RSV. Um, we'll see in the next week or, or so, uh, see what the impact of the, the gathering is for the holidays here uh, you know, during December in many parts of the world, as well as here in the U.S. And flu, um, have all our listeners learned that when you hear about vaccine effectiveness, <laughs> you need to ask, effective in preventing what? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the article, Vaccine Effectiveness Against Influenza A, Associated Hospitalization, Organ Failure, and Death, United States 2022-2023, was recently published in CID. And to understand effectiveness of the 2022-2023 um, influenza vaccine against influenza-associated hospitalization, organ failure, and death, a multi-center sentinel surveillance network in the United States prospectively enrolled adults hospitalized with acute respiratory illness between 1 October 2022 and 28 February 2023. Using the test-negative design, vaccine effectiveness estimates against these endpoints were measured by comparing the odds of current seasonal influenza vaccination in influenza positive case patients and influenza negative um, SARS-CoV-2 negative control patients. A total of 3,770 patients, including um, 714 flu cases, 33% vaccinated, 2,993 influenza and severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 negative controls, 49% of those vaccinated. Um, vaccine effectiveness against influenza-associated hospitalization was 
37% and varied by age. 18 to 64, it was 47. When they got to 65 and older, it was only 28%. Um, vaccine effectiveness against more severe influenza associated outcomes included um, 41% against influenza with hypoxemia, um, 65% against influenza with respiratory, cardiovascular, or renal failure treated with organ support, um, and 66% against influenza with respiratory failure treated with invasive mechanical ventilation. Now, vaccine effectiveness against influenza-associated death was, I'm going to throw in my own, only 48%. Hmm. However, the number of influenza-associated deaths was limited, so we have a wide confidence interval here. But my conclusion we need a better vaccine. But you still should get this one because it's better than nothing, right? You drop your risk of dying in half. That's big. Yeah. You know, Pretty people good. always say, you know, say, oh, I got that flu shot. I still got the flu. And what is my next question? Did you but die? did you die? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, let's, let's, you know, you can reduce your risk of death in half. That's worth doing. Um, and when should you do it? If you haven't done it, get out there and get it done because we are still seeing a significant rise um, in the influenza activity. Yeah, All it's right. really going up there now in, uh, in de December, yeah, it's right? it's really getting that exponential rise, right? Yep. So. yep. All right, COVID update. And, um, you know, I take these numbers from BNO News. A lot of our reporting is sort of falling down. Um, and what is going on with COVID? So um, cases are actually up. Um, in hospital is up. Uh, deaths are back up to uh, 1,682. So uh, about a 10% increase in the average weekly deaths. Um, and that really goes hand in hand with what we're seeing with the uh, wastewater. So really seeing you know continued rise in the Midwest, the Northeast, the other parts of the country are rising as well. Uh, beginning to think this copies per ml of sewage may have like an upper limit of normal or upper limit of 1,200. So we'll see like we're basically as high as the scale goes um, and uh, we'll have to see it. Can they go any higher? All right, children, COVID, and other vulnerable populations. Um, this is really hitting on a theme that I hope our, our listeners are, are getting, um, which is just how much you can do during that last trimester of, of pregnancy to protect uh, the newborn. And so the article, SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibody titers in maternal blood, umbilical cord blood, and breast milk was published in the Journal of Perinatology. Uh, really straightforward design. 100 women enrolled at admission for delivery. Uh, they looked at previous SARS-CoV-2 infection defined by anti-nucleocapsid antibodies. We discussed that before, how sensitive that might be or not. Um, levels of the um, neutralizing antibodies and binding antibodies against spike receptor binding domain were measured in the maternal blood, the cord blood, and the breast milk. They found that the levels of neutralizing antibodies in cord blood and milk correlated with the maternal levels and were higher in cord blood than maternal. Mm. Spike protein binding antibody levels correlated with neutralizing antibody and suggested that SARS-CoV-2 vaccination near delivery may boost antibody-mediated immunity in the peripartum period. And they point out that this study demonstrates that neutralizing antibodies are passed transplacentally and into the milk. Uh, they did find that maternal neutralizing antibodies were higher after vaccine and infection than vaccine alone, um, but they really waned rapidly, and you can see this data in figure one in the paper. Transmission, um, you know, I just want to reinforce, it's, it's around the holidays. Um, you know, those of us in healthcare across almost all the facilities when we're patient facing, we are wearing masks. We are, we are trying to keep our patients safe. Uh, I know there's been a lot of loss in momentum. I mean, I've been on flights recently and not seeing a lot of masks. Um, so just, just remember, um, the surgical masks really protect others from you catching those droplets, um, in more high risk situations, um, you know, N95 respirators and the like should be considered. So when I do these uh, clinical updates with Vincent, I feel very safe that Vincent's not going <laughs> to transmit over the airwaves. So yep, the advantages not. of telehealth and Zoom calls. 
All right, testing. I got a lot of questions um, about the article. Can you imagine this? I'm in remote Uganda and Panama, and people are sending me messages. Dr. Mm -hmm. Griffin, what do you think of this article? Well, the article, COVID-19 Rapid Antigen Test with Self-Collected versus Healthcare Collected, Healthcare Worker Collected Nasal and Throat Swab Specimens, a randomized clinical trial published in JAMA Network Open. Now, I have a few issues with how this article is written, so let me just write up front. Um, I like when authors are a little less obvious about their agenda and a bit more focused on their data, <laughs> but let us dissect what I will call the misleading sentence. Health authorities in the UK, Canada, and Israel recommend including a throat specimen for reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, SARS-CoV testing, while the US FDA has only authorized rapid antigen tests for use with nasal specimens and advises against using throat specimens. What a sense. Well, two different things are going on here. And perhaps the honest way to state the truth here is that in the US, we only have rapid antigen tests that have been approved based upon evidence supporting their sensitivity and specificity for nasal specimens. We previously discussed that the new variants may be detectable at a slight bit earlier time point using a throat PCR. But the question here is about rapid tests. So let's not compare PCR and rapid tests in the same sense. So these are results from an investigator-initiated multi-center randomized clinical trial conducted at two public COVID-19 test centers in Copenhagen, Denmark, from February 15th until March 25th, 2022. The participants had four specimens collected, two healthcare worker collected nasal and throat swab specimens for RT-PCR testing, and afterwards, two nasal and throat swab specimens randomized to either self or healthcare worker collected for rapid antigen testing. Flocked nasal swabs from a rapid antigen test kit, we want to know which one, standard Q COVID-19 antigen test um, by Biosensor Incorporated, uh, were used for both nasal and throat specimen collection for rapid antigen testing in the intervention and control groups. The detection rate was 86.6% for a nasal specimen and 94.2% for a throat specimen. The median CT value was lower for a healthcare worker collected nasal specimen. Remember, that means they're getting more than a healthcare worker collected throat uh, specimen, and they actually compare 16.7 versus 22.8. So that's about six cycles there. Um, for a single specimen, the mean sensitivity for rapid antigen testing was lower for a self-collected throat specimen than for a healthcare worker collected throat uh, specimen. So it's actually significant here, 53.7. Uh, when the healthcare worker does it, 69.4%. Um, um, comparable for self-collected and healthcare worker collected nasal specimens. Um, they reported that no difference was found between self-collected throat specimens versus nasal specimens for rapid antigen testing, 53.7% uh, with a confidence interval of 48.7 to 58.7 versus 57.9 confidence interval, 52.9 to 62.9. So not a statistically significant p-value. Then they tell us that in a subgroup analysis of participants with symptoms um, revealed that self-collected nasal specimens had significantly higher mean sensitivity than self-collected throat specimens, 71.5 versus 58%. Um, really, really encouraging was that this particular rapid test, the specificity was greater than 99.5 for the rapid antigen testing of all sample types. Because um, we've talked about how some of these kits um, can give us a lot of false positives. You know, you drink a soda, you have juice, et cetera. So let's pull all this together so that we're not just reading the headlines in the media. The authors point out that these results demonstrated that the throat sample technique is more challenging than obtaining a nasal sample as they found a lower sensitivity and a higher number of inconclusive rapid antigen tests for self-collected throat specimens compared with healthcare worker collected throat specimens. Um, in contrast, no difference was found when the healthcare worker collected and self-collected nasal specimens were looked at. 
The authors discuss in their discussion section that current tests are only authorized with nasal specimens and that redesigning the current rapid antigen test to include throat specimens will increase medical manufacturer costs and the complexity of home-based rapid antigen testing. Um, I'm also going to leave in a link in our show notes to the collection instructions um, in the supplementary material. So in short, it is it is a reasonable bit of science here. And if companies are willing to spend the time to demonstrate that their tests can be validated for throat testing, um, that is great. As we know, there there is there's virus, there's viral RNA, there's viral antigens in the throat that could be detected. Uh, we just need to know what tests do not have a specificity issue, um, so we don't end up with an excessive number of false positive uh, throat tests. Daniel, is there any need to? Validate a throat test when the nasal swab looks great? I mean, the, the nasal th- swab works. It's going to show up, you know, 10, 12 hours, sort of same window. I'm not sure there's really a clinical need for this. I, I think what we're really seeing here is a lot of people, you know, you know, social media, I've been saying this. And it's like, and what have you been saying? <laughs> so It's much easier to get a nasal sample than a throat sample, isn't it? Well, if you if you go and actually follow the links that I put in here, I mean, they're sending people mirrors. They're they're you know they've got cartoons. This is where you need to be swabbing. Um, you know, you're swabbing in the back of your throat. You're swabbing on the palatine tonsils. Who knows what those are? Um, yeah, it just <laughs> you're just making something. You know, we we already have an issue, right? Pe- people don't want to test, and now we're like, oh, we're going to make it more and more complicated. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess what I would just say, you know, uh, the the FDA has not validated tests for throat samples, right? So don't mm. just go taking one that's validated for the nares and start rubbing the back of your throat and then thinking, you know what to do with a positive test. If well, if you really are high <laughs> risk and whatever, we can do PCRs, et cetera. The swabs for the nasal kits are pretty short, so you'd have trouble <laughs> getting it to yeah, the Yeah, that's back also the weird, and they're different swabs. Like, so the ones that we do, like the anterior nares and the throat, they're kind of bigger ones. The ones that we're doing, the deeper brain biopsies are smaller ones. Yeah, so yeah. Th- there's actually a lot of, you know, I-, I think we've been putting a lot of uh, challenges on people. And and this, I almost worry that you might do more harm than good by just adding yeah. complexity to something. So, all right, ventilation transmission. Um, while this came out on December 5th, I did want to discuss this article. I was saving this for methods for monitoring SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A virus activity in schools, published as a research letter in JAMA Network Open. Um, the cool part of this study that I want to discuss is the air sampling. So in this study, air samplers, Thermo Fisher aerosol scents were placed in a communal gathering uh, spaces, uh, cafeterias in seven schools. Cartridges were analyzed twice weekly for the presence of um, influenza A virus and SARS-CoV-2. Influenza A virus and SARS-CoV-2 genetic material captured in air samples and detected using um, QRT-PCR assays targeting the influenza A virus, M gene, SARS-CoV-2, N1, N2, and RNA-P as an internal control. They found that air sampling provided equivalent results to home-based specimen collection using RT-PCR, um, cause specific absenteeism monitoring, and school-based rapid antigen testing. So kind of cool. You just sort of set these things up and you pull the cartridges out and it it gives you a, you know, instead of just trying to find in the wastewater, uh, this might actually even work in communities where they don't necessarily have wastewater, just basically sampling the air. Moving on to COVID early viral phase, um, you know, not no no big movers here. You you get acutely ill. You've got that positive test. Hopefully you're using the test correctly. Um High-risk individuals, number one, Paxlovid, remdesivir, malnupiravir, convalescent plasma, isolation for the infected, and avoid doing those harmful and useless things. Um, Second week, still very similar, steroids, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, remdesivir, but a little bit new on immune modulation, tocilizumab, but what about baricitinib? Well, the article, Efficacy and Safety of Baricitinib for the Treatment of Hospitalized Adults with COVID-19, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, recently published in the European Journal of Medical Research. Here, the authors searched in PubMed, Embase, and Cochrane Library databases on January 31, 2023. 
Um, but what about the gray literature, Vincent? <laughs> uh, they uh, looked closely. They report on 3,010 patients. All included studies were randomized control trials or prospective trials. No difference in 14-day mortality between the two groups. In subgroup analysis, they found that baricitinib did not seem to improve significantly in 24-day mortality, critically ill patients. Um, there was um, a faster recovery and shorter hospital stays for folks that got baricitinib. So, you know, there may still be a role there, but uh, perhaps tocilizumab is going to be the immune modulator of choice. This is a jack kinase uh, inhibitor, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right, late phase. Um, I, I found I found this article really encouraging. So it's the article Symbiotic Preparation, SIM01 for Post-Acute COVID-19 Syndrome in Hong Kong Recovery, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial published in The Lancet. Um, why was I so encouraged? Well, I feel like we might be pulling on the right thread. Uh, these are the results from a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial at a tertiary referral center in Hong Kong. Patients with post-acute COVID sequelae, PACS, PASC, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention criteria, were randomly assigned one-to-one -one by random permuted blocks to receive SIM01. This is a 10 billion colony forming units in sachets twice daily um, for six months. Um, now, what is SIM01? Mm -hmm. So the symbiotic preparation SIM01 is a micro-encapsulated lyophilized powder containing 20 billion colony-forming units of three bacterial strains. Um, there are different bifidobacterium, so bifidobacterium adolescentis, bifidobacterium bifidum, bifidobacterium longum, with three prebiotic compounds, including galacto-oligosaccharides, xylo oligosaccharides and resistant dextran, uh, which have been shown to promote the growth of these bacterial strains that are also other probiotic strains. Um, before we get lost in any word soup, I just want to clarify a symbiotic is defined as a mixture of probiotics, those bugs, and prebiotics, basically stuff that's going to improve their survival. Um, the probiotics are the bifidobacterium species, and the prebiotics, which are de described as non-digestible food ingredients, help those grow. So ultimately, we end up with 463 participants. About half of them get the, uh, the symbiotic. About half of them are getting placebo. At six months, a significantly higher percent of individuals with sim Zero one had alleviations in fatigue, more than twice as likely with a p value of zero point zero 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 one, about twice as likely to have um, improvement in memory loss, p value zero point zero zero two four, improved issues with concentration, about more than twice as likely to have improvements there, um, less GI upset improved general wellness. These are all very statistically significant. They held up adjusting for multiple comparisons. So about 47% um, improvement in fatigue, 56% memory loss, 62% concentration, 30% for GI upset, 31% for general wellness. So uh, potentially going to become available as a product from Genie Biome. Uh, maybe they'll like sponsor us or something. Uh, so this forward. is going to be, this is a thing you take orally, right? Yeah. It's basically going to be a pro and a prebiotic, uh, really targeting the disruption of the GI micro microbiome and really impressive that it wasn't just GI, but a lot, a lot of cognitive, which goes along with some of the earlier preliminary reports we've yeah. heard. I just would like to see this done in a different population because different, different populations have different microbiomes, right? You know, that's actually, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, you know, what works in Hong Kong might, might not, not work, work here, in, in yeah. Denmark or in the United States. So, But I could use yeah. better concentration for sure. <laughs> also, it'd be nice to sort of do some kind of a dose. Like, you know, are they just sort of hitting yeah. at 10 billion? That's always the challenge. I talk to patients that, you know, tell me, oh, I'm, you know, taking this probiotic. What dose? I'm like, I do not know. Is it 10 Is there billion? Any negative? Is there any negative to doing this? Um, no, actually, it was it was really well tolerated. So that's yeah. nice. 
All right. And uh, nice contrast to much of the doom and gloom. Um, we have the article COVID-19 recovery, consistent absence of cerebral spinal fluid biomarker abnormalities in patients with neurocognitive post-COVID complications, published in the Journal of Infectious Disease, um, where the authors report they found no evidence of ongoing viral replication, immune activation, or CNS injury in plasma or CSF in patients with neurocognitive uh, post-COVID conditions compared with COVID-19 controls or healthy volunteers, um, suggesting that neurocognitive PCC is a consequence of events that may have been suffered during acute COVID rather than sort of an ongoing process. Um, now, in the study, 31 patients um, underwent clinical exam, lumbar puncture, vena puncture. Um, they have healthy volunteers included. Um, they look at CSF and plasma um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, nucleocapsid, spike antigen, um, looked at a bunch of different markers, um, did principal component analysis. They didn't indicate any significant differences between the study groups and the marker set cytokines, neuronal markers, anti-cytokine autoantibodies. And all right, I'm going to get ready to wrap us up here with our last article, The Risk of New Onset Long COVID Following Reinfection with Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus 2, a Community-Based Cohort Study. Um, a word of warning, a slight word of warning for those who are relying on survivor immunity for protection. Um, here, these investigators estimated the likelihood of new onset self-reported long COVID after a second SARS-CoV-2 um, infection. And they included um, UK COVID-19 infection survey participants who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 between 1 November 2021 and 8 October 2022. The primary outcome was self-reported long COVID 12 to 20 weeks after each infection. Separate analyses were performed for those less than 16 and 16 and up. The estimated odds ratio for new onset long COVID comparing first, second to first infections, control for socio-demographic characteristics, calendar date of infection, plus vaccination status. Overall, long COVID was reported by those 16 and over after first infection, 4%, and after second infection, 2.4%, so an additional 2.4%. Uh, the corresponding estimates among those less than 16 quite a bit lower, 1% and less than 1%, 0.6%. So the adjusted odds ratio for long COVID after second compared to first infections was 0.72. So it is a lower risk um, for those over 16, um, but it's actually still a risk. You can still can get long COVID if you survived and didn't have long COVID after your first infection. And so I will wrap it up here. No one is safe until everyone is safe. I want everyone to pause the recording right here. Go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. Click that big donate button. I'm not sure whose donate button is bigger, ours or microbe.tv. <laughs> I must check. Um, but what we're doing right now is we're in the middle of our micro TV fundraiser. So whether a button is smaller or bigger, when you click our button, it doubles your donation up to a potential maximum donation of $20,000 for micro TV. So if you like what we're doing, if you don't like what we're doing, but you want us to continue, uh, please go ahead and support our work. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Denise writes, I would love to hear your input on receiving the COVID vaccine while pregnant after a prior infection during pregnancy. Background, I received my initial two Pfizer COVID vaccination shots in February 2021, my booster in October 2021. I then had a COVID infection January 2022. I have not received any further COVID boosters. I've been exposed to family members with COVID in the house a few times, but did not have another infection myself until this past summer while pregnant. I became pregnant in May of this year, had a very unpleasant bout of COVID in August when I was 13 weeks pregnant, much worse than my first time. I'm now 32 weeks pregnant due in early February. Would another COVID vaccination be supportive to me and or the baby at this point, even though I had an active infection while pregnant? I'm mo most interested in boosting the baby's immunity, and I plan to get the RSV shot in a few weeks as well. But if it's not necessary due to the infection a few months ago, I'm less inclined. Would love to hear your thoughts. Oh, I mean, so the, the timing is ideal, um, asking this question, because we really just covered the data here. Um, that 
prior vaccination doses, the prior infection, these are giving you a certain antibody level. But what we know is that a vaccination during that last trimester can really boost those levels. And that prior infection boosted your levels, but as we saw from the data, you actually have a pretty quick um, waning. So ideally, what you want to do is, is get that COVID vaccine during that last trimester. Not only is that going to boost your levels, but as we saw, that's going to boost the levels in your, in your breast milk. That's going to boost the levels in the cord, thus boosting those levels that are going to protect your newborn. So um, we would encourage that. And I like that you're also thinking about the RSV vaccine because we have a Bay Fortis shortage. So Really, the best thing, what we've been doing is encouraging uh, moms to get vaccinated during that last trimester. Last thing you want to do is have your baby and then find out you don't have access to the Bay Fortis. Clark writes, would you please tell me the source of the number of weekly deaths in the U.S. from COVID-19? As a physician, from time to time, I am asked and would like a reliable URL source to reference and cite. Okay, excellent. Yeah. You know, it's sort of a shame. I mean, during the heyday of the pandemic, right? Like you had Hopkins, you had so many people reporting for us. Um, now I've been actually looking at BNO News each week just to, to get some numbers to go by. Scott writes, finally had COVID after many chances. My only symptoms a day after my RSV vaccine, nausea, vomiting, and feeling achy. It took me more than 24 hours before I even thought to test. After the first 24 hours, even before Paxlovid, I felt much better. Interestingly, still on the last day of Paxlovid, I had Paxlovid rebound with cold symptoms and fatigue, evidently not from the Paxlovid. Question one, you've talked a lot about the five-day course of Paxlovid, but how was it originally decided to treat for five days? Traditionally in medicine, we have guessed on a 10-day or seven-day or three-week treatment, and then often years later, studies are finally done to see what might actually be best? Yeah, so l let's start with that. I, I think that's a great, like, you know, why five days? Why not 10? Why not 15? And, you know, when I went to medical school, pneumonia, you know, we told people they had to take uh, their antibiotics for 21 days, and then we would berate them. Why are you not finishing it? If you don't finish it, we're going to have antimicrobial resistance and the world will end. And over time, we've realized, you know, actually 21 was not great and probably was driving AMR. Um, we've realized with almost all of our therapeutics, with a few exceptions, that really three to five days is, is actually the window. Um, and what we've seen in a couple things with COVID, for instance, we looked at remdesivir. We looked at five days versus 10 days. Five was actually slightly better than 10 days, interesting enough. Um, we've seen that if we wait till after 10 and viral replication has gone down, you're really not doing very much. Um, and don't be misled by a bunch of sloughing um, nasal epithelial cells, you know, with, with a, you know, rebound, et cetera. So um, the five has really been built upon a history of understanding, a history of understanding the viral kinetics, and also a bit of a history of other antivirals that we've used in this disease. Um, I will say there's ongoing trials looking at 5, 10, 15 in Paxlovid. So we will see, and I'm humble mm -hmm. enough to say that when we get that data, I will share it. And whichever way it goes, that's what I will go with. All right. And question two, I've tried to get an understanding of how and where Paxlovid works, reading some articles, et cetera, but not being a virologist, I keep wondering if it could also suppress the replication of any other viruses. Yeah, no, so that's a great question. I mean, so uh, certain antivirals seem to be, you know, potentially, you know, pan, uh, pan viral, right? If they're working on an RNA polymerase and you happen to get some um, interaction with others, this is working on a protease. So you'd have to be looking at other viruses that rely on a similar enough protease. And what is a protease? Um, you know, a lot of viruses, other organisms will make really long proteins and then just chop them up into the component pieces. I think this, I think Paxlovid will work on some other coronaviruses, but not as well as SARS-CoV-2. And unlikely other viral families because the proteases are really different. Yeah. Uh, Mary Ann writes, this is a question from my daughter-in-law with an almost five-month-old. Her sister has COVID and she got it from her husband. She had to stop breastfeeding at six weeks to go back on a mental health medication she needed, but pumped extra during those six weeks, hoping it might be helpful. And here's her question. You know uh, what I'm curious about, and I think it's a question for an immunologist. Does giving breast milk once a week or twice a month provide any antibodies protection to a primarily formula-fed baby? 
Yeah, I mean, as as we've talked about several times, is there are antibodies in that breast milk. There's also more than antibodies, right? There's also some cellular immune that gets um, transmitted across. Um, you know, you, you think the antibodies are going to be fine with the refrigeration, but yeah, this would be interesting to ask an immunologist about the <laughs> cellular component, right? Well, you're an immunologist, aren't you, Daniel? I guess that's true. <laughs> I do have a PhD in immunology. I'm trying to be humble here, Vincent. Um, no, but I, I do think that there is some advantage to that breast milk, you know, as much as you're able to provide. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And everyone, be safe. 